But dude, walk this around while I get this going, please. Bowler transmission. Lingen filter engine. There's Chad. <laughs> uh -oh. That didn't work very well. There's Cole. All right, everybody. We're here with Mark Rapson and Ken Lingenfelter to discuss the Lingenfelter Performance Engineering LS3 that makes 579 horsepower that will be installed in the new 48-hour Camaro. Guys, you want to come over here since there's some background noise? So where are you going to do it? This side? Well, there's a good amount of background noise and I can't quite use the mic the same way with this phone, so this oh, is what we got. So we actually need to turn around so we're not filming right into the light. And you do your sauce too. We're good. All right. We're live, everybody. YouTube live. Nice. Well, I have to say we're back here with the Ride Tech 48 Hour Camaro. And, uh, and I wanted to introduce Mark and Ken. If you guys don't know Ken Lingenfelter, then you should. Um, obviously, Lingenfelter power going into the 48 Hour Camaro. This is not the first 48 Hour Camaro to have your power, or the first one the 48 Hour Camaro. So, you guys have had a different relationship with Ride Tech. It's not a few years, but it's good. Hey, can you ask them to stop for a minute? Put the grinding. Use, yeah. your, use your mean face. Well, and Mark, you brought Mark out, and you made him, uh, wait, you forced him to come hang out with us, or you let him? <laughs> I'm not sure which it is yet. He twisted my arm, but I didn't give him much fun. Okay, then. <laughs> well, Mark, tell us about this particular combo. Yeah, it's an LS3, which was specifically for the 48 hour Camaro. They overachieved a little bit what they actually requested color wise, which is always okay to have a little more than a little less. But it's a 579 horsepower engine at uh, 6,500 RPM. It's a great motor. Um, good flat part. Well, and, and you know, the power numbers that are cap you're capable of making with LS engines is just insane. But the thing that I think people forget about, you don't mention enough, is that here you have an engine that makes nearly 600 horsepower that will run for tens of thousands of miles with no drama. I mean, they don't leak oil, they don't break, they don't, you know what I mean? I mean, that's what these are all about. Yeah. The power numbers aren't anything if you don't have a lot of water to go Make the big numbers, make the reliability, make it a drive. I mean, this guy's not only going to run in performance, but it's going to run speed as well. So it's a balance between between the two having a good performance and having a good performance down the street. 48 hour runs are for thousands of miles on it before we pulled it out. And that was all racing. Yeah, yeah. It was still running good, but it was got down on the car. We're not seepering on it. And uh, John Rucker passed me, and I was running like 100. Yeah. And uh, see if you can go as fast as you possibly can. And we finally decided, yeah, we, we finally got to pull this thing out. Yeah, but that's an unbelievable amount of miles when you consider the amount of racing that it did yeah, and the way that it was brutal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember when autocross, you know, it's 30 seconds per minute. You're anywhere from three to a mile to maybe half a mile. 
but we have 30 corners in there, and we're going from 2,500 to 7,500 again all the time. Yeah. And these guys know what we want when I give all our secrets of what we do inside that motor. <laughs> they make it so we can shoot gates. Right. Well, and I have to say, one of the things I was really excited about this, and I'm normally not the like cosmetics guy. I don't care. I, I don't. My, most of my stuff's not pretty because I don't have enough money for pretty. But these new valve covers and coil covers are rad. These are super cool. Like really, really clean, really neat. The way that they work. Um, honestly, this is probably one of the nicer solutions I've seen to this. The the problem of PM coils because. You can relocate them, everybody's got kits for that and all those things. But I hate to tell anybody, but they're not pretty on the valve cover and they're not pretty on the firewall. Like they're just not pretty. That's the right. way to do it, I think. It really is. Yeah. This is the perfect solution, right? Everything yeah. bolts together, you got the two piece valve covers, the coils are all mounted in stock locations to completely cover up. Yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's way cool. And it um it makes the motor look a little beefy. That's the one thing about an LS is they got little bitty valve covers because the rail is so tall, so the rocker sits way down in there. You don't need a, a tall valve cover typically. But with these, man, it makes it's it look a little good. bit of a big block. Yeah, it does. These are manly valve covers. They are manly. manly. We have manly stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's a cool combo. Now, Mark, why um, why do you go with the Holly intake with the uh, you know traditional four barrel style? You know. Yeah, it's probably about the old school one. Yeah, old school traditional. I mean, these new Harley uh, EFI systems, even though they look like the carburetors, they're fuel injected. They make great power. They don't give up any power on these type of cars. These type of manifolds, and when you look at it, it has that old school, um, uh, the right arrow look to the, to the yeah. car. Right? It's, it's yeah, because you put a traditional air cleaner on this exactly, thing exactly. and have that look. I'm with you. Great. You don't give up any power, you don't give up any torque on them, they're all Right. Yeah, they are. Actually, they're really easy to tune, which is really nice. Well, and this engine, uh, uh, again, is LS3 based. You guys make, I mean, you build a lot of different LS engines. I mean, at any power level, anybody wants, right? Chad is successful with this Yeah. I mean, I don't know what we, what we have, 15%, 18% of the cars are running on the Yeah. Always run on it. And uh, they've been incredible. Well. So it's a perfect combination. Of In fact, that reliability, we've got motors in the Optimus series that are on their third year of our turnaround. Yeah. And still with it. That says a lot for that says a lot for the build. Uh, and if you're at home and you don't know what the typical teardown routine is on something, it's hard to it's hard to quantify it on a car that's autocrossing and road racing in the pro touring environment. So I'll give you what normally would be in a drag race environment. In a drag race environment, a hundred passes is, is normally what a, a real motor is going to go before getting torn down, getting lifters inspected, getting new rings, bearings put in it, etc., and freshen it up. Um, maybe a hone, you know, that kind of thing. If you don't break anything. On an autocross, I mean, really, it's more brutal that one autocross pass than a drag strip pass. I mean, because on the drag strip pass, you're revving the thing three times or four times, depending on how many gears you have, and that's it. But on the autocross, it's pretty set. You're aiming gate to gate to gate, and just wide open, wide open, wide open, wide open. And quite frankly, the wide open isn't the hard part on an engine. It's the deceleration. 99% of connecting rod failures in any engine happen when you lift off the throttle not when you're on the throttle. And if that doesn't convince you about the merits of reliability, how about towing 800 miles and blowing up in the warm-up session at a track day, you know? Right, I mean, exactly. you, you need to make it to the other end of the event, and yeah. then the other three events after that. Well, and that's the thing, is like nobody concerns themselves with driving their car to an event, like the good guys here and autocrossing it, and then driving at home another five or six or eight or 10 hours. You know, not all of us have giant enclosed trailers to do it. If we're going to run our car, we have to drive it there to do it, you know? I mean, a lot of that is what we build our agents to us, understanding what the customers need to do. Right. And that, that makes a big difference. When we get in the car, we can, what Rod's playing, this is all about building the cars. not just about the numbers. Right. It's about what the car is going to be used for and making sure that where the power is is where it needs to be for whatever that application is. It's hard to bench race about reliability, though. It's like, hey, Chad, my car is reliable. Yeah, I know. But it, it's, <laughs> that's where you prove it by just driving and what it really does when you're out there. And the fact that you're, 
out there every week. Nowadays, it's hard to hide when your stuff is broke, right? We're so we're so connected in social media and everything. If you blow your junk up one week, then everybody knows it, right? Like, why aren't you out at the autocross this week? Oh, I don't know, because the crane shaft is like on the floor of my garage, right? So you can't hide that stuff anymore. So if your combo isn't reliable, everybody's gonna know. You know, there's just no way. Again, like I said, it's you cannot pretend. It. Oh. Oh. Me too. I'm really particular about, actually, I will say, one thing that I find frustrating about LS engines is that some exhaust systems sound horrible on them. I think they're a little more finicky on what exhaust you want to put on them, but when you get the right one, yeah, nothing sounds better than this thing at 6,500. Which you said 6,500, that's a big deal too, because this is not an 8,000 RPM combo. And it doesn't need to be. People often get lost in the fact that they go, oh yeah, I want to spin the thing to 75. They don't understand that for every 500 RPM you go over 65, you dramatically decrease the cost of parts that are going to stay reliable. That's the big deal. Valve tree becomes a huge deal. It isn't really the rods and pistons and crankshaft. They're nearly as important as valve tree. Very stable valve tree. The other nice product, just 6,500 RPM. The other interesting thing about the way this is canned is, you, is the horsepower does not drop off after a lot of these you see them folding. Yeah. If you look at the dyno graph, it gets up to 65 to 66 and it just runs that horsepower right out. Right. So, so if, yeah, so if, if they are driving this thing and Brett goes, you know, down a short shoot in an autocross where he's at 6,500 and they span, I'm going to have to shift it. He doesn't have to. If he wants to run the thing to 68 or 90, he's not losing any power. He's going to stay right up. He's got all the torque around it, and I said, you know, 470 pounds of torque, the 450 of us are at 3,000 RPM. That's amazing. Which is great with that automatic transfer. It's just kind of an exciting combo running the automatic transfer. Oh, yeah. automatic behind you. This is kind of a sort of a new combination for this type of build, but it's quite interesting. And I think that there's a lot of people that really could benefit from running this kind of combo. I think so too. Um, to really, for an all around, fun car to have, you know. Um, now, on the subject of this particular engine and this build, I want to mention one thing real quick. We were talking about the charity group. Okay, so you have a, an amazing car collection. I have been lucky enough to be there, although you've been telling me about new stuff. I'm going to have to come back and bring Cole so we can look at it. But you guys, um, you know, you have a lot of cars, you have a lot of fun, you have a really neat business, all those things. You're a very fortunate person and you're really cool about trying to give back. Um, and so you've opened up the doors of your place for anybody and everybody to come and, and utilize it if they'd like for different kind of charitable events. So tell us a little bit about that. Actually, it's an immense mission. Mike Pitson and I decided that you know the goal was to make sure that we had the greatest venue to attract really good charities yeah. uh, for fundraising. Yeah. And uh, it's, we have 250 cars to win, we to keep about 200 in the facility. And uh, we do some great events with some really great groups. And our real big one is uh, American Cancer Society. That's uh, going to be April 28th this year. Yep. Uh, at the Collection of Great Michigan. And uh, we have about 5,000 people on that day last year. Yeah. Our other real big one is for breast cancer in the fall. Yep. Breast cancer awareness in October. But you know, all in all, we did about 50 events in this year. Wow. And, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun place. Yep. It is. Yep. And it's, it's everything. It's 30% muscle cars, like you and I were talking earlier. Yep. 30% exotics, and the rest are uh, Corvettes, obviously. Yeah. That's the main product. But it's not the only vet. You have a Chevette as well. There's a few weird ones because because Ken has a taste for some of the oddball stuff, just some cool little oddball things. So there are some ones that you will see there that will have you talking for a long time. Stuff you've never seen and likely will never ever see anywhere else. Everything from a Chevette to a LaFerrari. Yeah. One end of the other. That's what you're facts Absolutely. It's cool. Well, thank you for being involved. Seriously, I'm Mark, you know how much we love you guys and we appreciate it. And I know, you know, Brett and the guys are all working hard to get all of this stuff ready to go in and, 
Um, but they really appreciate all the effort and all of the, you know, all the help you guys have been for a long time. I know Smitty appreciates it every time he whacks the throttle on that Corvette, although it's leaving on Saturday. Oh, I know. I told Brian yesterday, I said, you have to be really bad if the white person buys that car. Different people interested in it. Dude, I don't know which one will make you cry more, when it leaves here or when you get beat by it. <laughs> that would be bad. I'm not real sure. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. But it goes on the block Saturday evening or afternoon. Or afternoon to lunch the block, I believe. Okay. Yeah. The acceleration is a tuning factor in these cars that people just don't understand. We change the Corvette, we change much weight multiple times. Engine braking in what we do is so critical to corner entry. Oh yeah. Just don't understand it. We ran a 17-pound plus hand flywheel assembly in that car. The acceleration side of it is where right. we want that car to slow down right now. We want it to suck down the shop. You know, it's hard about the right engine company. We can't do that because you will blow the rods up. Right? Oh, yeah. And we, we ran that motor 75, 77 RPM all the time. Yeah. All the time. If you watch the video, you hear the videos on the right page. Hey, you hear the engine chips all the time. Yeah. Which has Mark and Ken going. You're evil! Why are you being mean to it? No, but yeah. yeah. All these parts you can do that. That oh, yeah. is actually meant to turn Right. And the parts are meant to go 85. Yeah. And that, you know, that's one of the biggest mistakes I think the consumers make is they don't know what they need when they come to them. You'd be like, what are you doing? No. Uh, and actually, it's a four-week trip. It's a car. Well, again, thank you guys for sure. We're going to be stabbing this thing in probably later this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, again, we're doing, we've got multiple tests in it. So, yeah, it should be good. All right, well, thanks, guys. Again, thank you, guys. Very much. Thank you, Mark. We'll be back with more updates soon, right here live. From thanks, Chad.